Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing very well. So today we are at a different corner of my room than normal because it is a little bit later in the day when I am filming and it is not very bright outside. And therefore I am using the functionality of the ring light that one of my best friends got me back last Christmas. And I think it does really go to show how bad I am with technology that I have only just realized that this ring light, the tripod that I can use for this ring light actually extends to like more than this high and I can actually get it from the ground to sitting level here. I don't know about standing, I've not yet tried that out. You learn something new every day. But I had to be sat over here because I got my laptop out and the reason for that is that I am going to be doing my tier ranking of the historical fiction reads that I read in 2021. Another one of the retrospective let's look back at 2021 and how my reading went videos and just completely copying the format of last time I did one of these in 2020. Just going through every single historical fiction book that I read and having a little think about how how much I like them. I've got up the Tear Maker website and I have the covers up of the 20 historical fiction books that I read in 2021, which is one down from what I read in 2020. It feels kind of wrong. I feel like I should have read 21 in 2021 and 20 in 2020, but unfortunately, no, it's the other way around. But I don't think that's bad going. So let me work out the technology so I work out how to do my split screens. So I want a screen recording. So here we have the tier ranking website all up, all looking nice and pretty with my 20 book covers down below. And then I've got my tiers here. I've not done anything special for them. I know that for some people they like to label them, but I have just gone for emoji. So we've got the heart eyes emoji for a book that I think was absolutely fantastic. A rosy cheeked smiley for things that were probably around about a four star for me. Middle of the road gets a little straight faced look. Not one that I would gush about, but I probably would still recommend it if you are interested in certain topics. Then we have the emoji. This is a book that I definitely had issues with, but not one that I hated so badly as to have the sweary face emoji. Books that I had real issues with. <laughs> Pretty straightforward, simple enough, so I think we will just go in order of where the covers are on my screen. So starting off we have The Duke and I by Julia Quinn. This is the first book in the Bridgerton novels, and I was actually quite pleasantly surprised by this one. I still haven't watched the Netflix adaptation of Bridgerton. I'm quite ashamed to admit I had all intentions of watching it this year and I just didn't get around to doing it. But I think part of it was because I wanted to actually read the books first. But I read this first one and I did really enjoy it. Aside from the chapter in this that everybody it seems also dislikes. There is a scene of sexual assault in The Duke and I, one that is perpetrated by a female character to a male character and yeah I just thought it was absolutely unnecessary. I don't feel like the character who did this actually had the proper repercussions for what she did. I think she was just rewarded for it and it was just kind of swept under the rug which I didn't like and I feel like if you could have taken that aspect out of it I would have absolutely loved this book. It probably would have been a five star read because I had so much fun with it. So I am going to put it in the third tier because I did really enjoy it aside from that one scene and I probably would read the rest of them later. I don't know when I'm going to get around to doing that but you know I, I, I liked it. It was good fun Regency romps. Next we have The Master of Petersburg by J.M. Kutsia. I believe this is about a fictional version of Dostoevsky. I hope I got my Russian author right there. <laughs> and it's his reimagining of Dostoevsky's life in which his son has died and it's him really processing his grief. I can't believe we're on the second book in a row where there is a very unnecessary sexual assault scene that I really did not like. And another one where the character who perpetrates it, Dostoevsky himself, doesn't actually face any repercussions for it, not even like emotional ones. It's just swept under the rug and we never hear about it again. It's just there just for like titillation, I think. So nah. I think the depictions of grief were really good, but aside from that, I didn't really care for it. I actually went back and watched my February wrap up where I talked about this. And I think I quite liked some of that grief writing, as I say, but I feel like the more and more that I've thought about this book, the lower it has slipped in my mind. Next, we have The Revolt, which is an Eleanor of Aquitaine retelling. I remember being really excited about this one, but being a little bit let down by the execution. Eleanor of Aquitaine is a really fascinating character, but what I liked about this is that it started off from the perspective of Richard the Lionheart, who was her son. And at first I thought, oh, this is really great. We're getting an insight into this complex female character from the perspective of her son who loves her but doesn't always understand her and a lot of the narrative in that first section is building up this sense of she's always at a distance to him and I really liked that up until the point where we got to the second part of the book which was from her perspective and then suddenly all of that mystery all that tension was just lost because she just explains everything and I don't think that was really satisfying. So I'm not really sure where I want to put this. I feel like if I put it on the second tier it's too low but then I feel like I much preferred the Bridgeton book to the revolt so I don't know. I don't know. 
I think I'm gonna end up putting it on the lower side of the third tier. Maybe just for the novelty that it was the first book that I think I've read maybe ever that was medieval historical fiction. I've actually changed that now, I've actually read a little bit more since then. The Familiars by Stacey Halls that is going to the bottom tier because it was probably my least favourite book that I read this year, I just did not like it at all. Once again we've got the witchy wise woman trope that I do not like, I thought the writing in here was just so superfluous and bloated, there was a lot of gratuitous like gore and blood for absolutely no reason I think other than to shock. I feel like you're probably gonna get from this that I don't like like hard subjects tackled in my books which is absolutely not the case, I am absolutely fine to see blood and gore and to confront hard topics in my fiction but I feel like it actually has to have a purpose other than to shock. And there were just lots of comments in this that I just thought were a bit Odd. For example, comparing the redness of the wine that she was drinking to the colour of her miscarriages. I, I, mm, mm, mm. I didn't see why that was there, I think it was just there to shock people. So I didn't like it. Next up we have The Emperor's Babe by Bernadine Evaristo. This is taking place in Londinium in the early AD time. I can't remember exactly what century, but it was Roman Britain. This is also a story that is told in verse, which I think is the first book at least for quite a while that I've read in verse. I am going to pop this up to the higher end of the third tier. I really did enjoy this, it's not my favourite Bernadine Evaristo by any means and I probably wouldn't put it in the upper echelons, but I thought for what it did it was really good. The Silent Stars Go By by Sally Nichols. I literally just read this and I can't even remember what the author's called. This was a bit of a Christmas romance told at Christmas 1919 that we do get some flashbacks to World War One. All about two lovers who are reconnecting after they had previously been betrothed to marry but then he went missing missing, he was a prisoner of war, he came back, suddenly there is a new baby in the nursery and whose could it be? I mentioned this in my December wrap up, I thought that it, you know, it was nice enough but I did think it was there was just no tension, it was very predictable where the plot was going and I think it irked me because of that. I think I probably preferred it to Master of Petersburg and definitely much more than the familiars but I did have so many gripes with it that I don't think I can give it higher than like the higher side of the second tier. Ariadne by Jennifer Saint, another one that is going on the second tier. I think purely because I was so excited for this and the cover was so beautiful. This is all about Ariadne, it's a Greek myth retelling of this female figure that I find incredibly fascinating and yet once again I just found the prose to be so dull. I feel like there is so much you can do with Ariadne's story and I feel like Jennifer Saint just missed every trick for it and yet I'm still looking forward to her next book which is Electra. I think that is just a sign of how good cover design will do a lot for a book. The Wolf Den by Elodie Harper, this one is going into the second tier up here. This is set in Pompeii in I think 76 AD and is all about the character of Amara who works in the brothels of Pompeii. She was sold there when she was younger as a slave and it's all about like the female friendship and camaraderie, it's about her attempts to get her freedom and I really enjoyed this, I was quite surprised by how much I enjoyed this and I'm definitely looking forward to the next book coming out. The Dictionary of Lost Words by Pip Williams I'm putting into the third tier, definitely the upper side of the third tier. This is one that I actually did a whole review on and it does hold like a special place in my heart because it was one of the first books that I read when I moved down to Oxford and it's a book that is just infused and drenched in Oxford which was very very helpful for me when I was trying to navigate my way round and actually as part of the review I took a little walking tour of the different places that are mentioned within the Dictionary of Lost Words and that was such a great time but I did have some issues with the writing, with the plot. I wasn't as engaged as I would like to be even though there are a lot of things in this that would really tick boxes for me, you know, it's about words and the power of words. It's about women in history and the place that they can carve out for themselves when they are not afforded as many rights as men. Another one that is very much about female friendship. There are a lot of things in here that I enjoy but I feel like there was just too much that was being focused on in here but still I enjoy it, it's got a special place in my heart so I couldn't put it too low. Definitely sitting around Bernadine Evaristo I would say. Hurdy Gurdy by Christopher Wilson, another medieval fiction and one that I am going to put mm, actually probably lower than Ariadne for me. This is set initially at a monastery just as the Black Death is sweeping its way over to England and Brother Digri who is the main character ends up being caught up in the plague. He ends up contracting the disease but after a few days he wakes up and he is the sole survivor of his monastery and it's him trying to make his way in the world now that he doesn't have the constraints of this religious order on him. Where is he going to go now? This is really pitched as being a very comic novel but I didn't find it to be that funny. There were little bits here and there that I found amusing but 
it was not like the romp that I had been promised. And aside from that, I just found the prose just a bit bland and forgettable. And I think like Ariadne, I think the expectation that I had for this was so high that it ended up really severely disappointing me. Shuggy Bane by Douglas Adams. This was the winner of the Booker Prize back in 2020. I feel like everybody at this point has heard about this. I'm going to pop this over at the bottom end of the third tier because it is a fantastic book. It was just one that wasn't really for me. I found it just a little bit too drugged out. The story didn't engage me as I think it should have done. It's just one of those that didn't hit the spot for me, but I can see why why other people would enjoy it. Then we have Cecily by Annie Garthway. That is going to go in the second tier. I absolutely love this book. This retells the story of Cecily Neville, who was the wife of Richard Duke of York, and who went on to become the mother of Edward IV and Richard III. I think the best comparison that I could give to this book is something like Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. And as we know, that is the highest praise I can give for this book. I don't think it has sunk into my heart quite as much as the Wolf Hall trilogy does, but I am very, very excited to read whatever she comes out with next. And actually back in October, Annie Garthway reached out to me on Twitter and she said thank you for the review that I'd done of it and I was just like <laughs> Next we have Ithaca Forever by Luigi Malerba. This is a retelling of the Odyssey told from the perspective mainly of Penelope. It is taking place after Odysseus has made his way back to Ithaca and he is disguised as this old man. And the twist in the story is that when Penelope sees Odysseus, she recognises instantly that it is him. Whereas there is kind of a bit of ambiguity in the Odyssey. I've always read it that Penelope didn't recognise him until Odysseus revealed himself. Though I know Rasheen mentioned that she'd always read that Penelope did recognise him, that you could see it that way. I, once again, I, I, I've never seen it that way. But you know, you could convince me that I'm wrong. I've never seen it that way. I've always thought that the original story wanted us to believe that she didn't recognise him. And also because if she does recognise him in the original story, it kind of makes this story a bit <laughs> null and void. And there were many ways in which I felt like the potential of this book just was not fulfilled. And I feel like it's doing so much to try to twist the original narrative. And there are actually points in this book where you think that because of the trickery that has gone on between Penelope and Odysseus, that they are not actually going to be able to reconcile with each other but then the book very quickly the conclusion very quickly it tries to wrap things up and tries to get things back to the original story and I just thought what's the point of this why are you going to twist the story so much if you're not actually going to commit to an ending and actually stick that ending how can things wrap up the same way as they did in the original story when you've done so much to mess with it but I do like reading about Penelope and Odysseus Odysseus is probably my favorite character in Greek myth I just probably can't do more than the lower side of the third tier 13th tale by Diane Setterfeld I don't like it. This is now the third Diane Setterfield book that I have read and um, yeah, no, no, not an author for me. Rizzio by Denise Mina. This is retelling the murder of David Rizzio, who was one of Mary Queen of Scots' companions, her secretary. I really quite enjoyed this. It's a very short little ditty thing if you're into historical fiction and you want a bit of a taste of Mary Queen of Scots' court or you want a bit of historical crime then I would definitely go for this. Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Another one that I was really anticipating and I know a lot of people were disappointed by this but I really enjoyed it. I don't think it quite hit the heights of things like The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo or Daisy Jones and the Six but I think there were so many aspects of this that were just Taylor Jenkins Reid doing what she does best which is talking about fame and relationships. I don't know, I enjoyed it. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Now, I, I, I feel like there are a lot of ways in which, in terms of being a historical fiction read, you could criticise it, but I don't care. Best fiction book, at least, that I've read this year. And it's funny because, like I say, I do often say that this is a historical fiction book that isn't as truly engaged with its history as maybe you would want it to be. But I think that is kind of part of the premise, the fact that Addie, she is so attuned to the present and what is happening in the immediate moment because she has to be. So therefore she is not as engaged in the history happening around her, especially since she spends so much of her time in 18th century France, you'd think that she'd be so engaged with it, but she isn't because of the necessity of the curse that she's under. It's only really when she looks back and reflects that she can really engage with what she was living around. And I love it, and I will take no further questions about my decision at this time. House of Names by Colm Tobin, a retelling of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, and another one that didn't quite live up to the height I had for it in my head. Gonna kind of stick it around here. Maybe shift it. Swan Song. This was all about Truman Capote and his ladies and the story of him publishing a piece that was really a bit of a tell-all, including a lot of sordid details about their personal lives and them really rejecting him after this and how their friendships fractured. I 
really quite enjoyed this and I was quite surprised at how much I enjoyed this. I don't think I'm going to put it quite in like the top two tiers, but it's definitely the higher end of the third tier. I think it was really well done, but it just hasn't left this massive lasting impact on me. And then finally, the Mirror in the Light play written by Hilary Mantel and Ben Miles. The only reason that this isn't going straight to the top is because it doesn't have all of the detail, all the rich vivid description that the original book has, but you know, I still love it. I just love Wolf Hall so much. Okay, so that is my final little tier ranking of the books that I read in 2021. And yeah, it's kind of been a bit of a middling year, as you can see, a lot of books in that third section, equal number in like my four stars and two stars, and then it really thins out towards the bottom and the top end. And I'm kind of disappointed that there weren't more books in like my five star absolute loves, especially when you compare it to last year. That being said, there were more two stars last year. So I guess you win some, you lose some. But I think because things were a a lot more evenly spread out last year it does feel like this year it just wasn't as successful a historical fiction reading year but you know hopefully this year will be a little bit more successful i do have plans to read some pretty fantastic historical fiction this year i've just finished up reading galatea by madeline miller which is a little short story i'm currently reading lear wife by jr thorpe and beloved by tony morrison both of which are historical fiction and if you go ahead and watch my full tbr video that is going to be coming up either it is out now or it's coming up in the next video you'll be able to have a look and see what historical fiction is on my horizons. But there we go, that is everything that I have for you today. Do let me know if you've read any of the historical fiction books that I mentioned. Do you have differing opinions about them or do you think the same as me? Alternatively, let me know about any different books that you've read and particularly any you think that I might like. I hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, bye!